in this decade, I'm supposed to ask you to switch off your cell phones and pagers so that they don't interrupt us during the lecture. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. And, uh, and, and also thank you for once again filling the, the, the lecture hall. It's really amazing to see all of you here today. Um, and, and one last thing, I'd like to remind you that on Wednesday, uh, Jeremy Harris, who's the mayor of Honolulu, is going to be here uh, to give us another off-cycle lecture uh, at 4 p.m. And that one's going to be uh, uh, quite uh, interesting. So I encourage you all to be here uh, for, for next Wednesday's lecture. Uh, that will replace the one supposed to happen during fall break, um, unless you want us to move it to fall break. OK. All right, so you don't want to do that. Let's do it uh, Wednesday at 4 o'clock. We'll see you back here. Um, I'd like to, to, to welcome Renee Chang, a uh, fellow Mac user uh, <laughs> to, to Ball State University. Um, she has, uh, uh, Renee graduated from Harvard's Graduate School of Design in 1989 after receiving her AB with honors in psychology from Harvard College. She's a registered architect since 1991. Her professional experience includes work with Kay, Cobb, and Tree and partners of which we have one of the buildings uh, up here on campus. Um, Richard Meyer and Partners, uh, before founding Chang Olson Design with her partner, Eric Olson, in 1992. She taught at the University of Michigan and the University of Arizona before joining the faculty at CALA in January of 2002. She was named Director of Design for the Department of Architecture in the fall of 2002 and head of the department in the summer of 2004. She's been recognized for teaching excellence at the local, state, and national levels with awards such as the AIA Arizona Educator of the Year, 2000, the ACSA, AIAS New Faculty Teaching Award. Her teaching motto might be summarized by Joseph Albert's reply when asked why he taught. He answers, to make open the eyes. To make open the eyes. That's her teaching philosophy. That's um, very wonderful. Her research involves documenting case studies of buildings that integrate design with emerging technologies. She's been tracking several large-scale projects by Frank Gehry, a one you see on the lecture poster, and associates, as well as smaller-scale CAD CAM work done by firms such as Shaw, Laser Office, and Tripyramid. She is interested in ways that design ideas are mediated as they become built reality. Please join me in welcoming to Ball State University, Renee Chang. to uh, the invitation from Kevin, it was really, really nice. I've been actually meaning to come to Ball State for a long time, ever since Wes was telling me about some of the things that they were doing, so I finally, finally made it here. I'm really glad to be here. Um, so when Kevin asked me to come, he said, well, it'd be great if you could do something about you know, digital, something about representation, and that's a lot of what I've been doing is kind of something about those things for quite a while. Um, and I just want to preface this talk by saying that I'm actually interested in digital but I'm not particularly interested in blogs. And I'm interested in representation, but I'm not particularly interested in pretty pictures. On the other hand, in this lecture, I'm going to be showing you plenty of blogs and quite a few pretty pictures. So I just wanted to get that out there. But that's not necessarily what I'm showing them to you for. I'm trying to get beyond the um, kind of formal and compositional meetings, which is the um, hard to do, but um, to try to get beyond them to see deeper patterns or deeper understandings of things um, that could affect the way that we move forward in architectural education and for you all as architects. Um, even though a lot of what you need to know to understand the lecture is how or maybe even why do the architects do it, what I'm really trying to ask is what can we learn from what they're doing or what might it mean for architecture or even how can we continue to use drawing and representation as a means of exploration and communication without reducing it to merely representation or seduction. 
And in the cat cam world that I'm talking about here, representation is no longer means it should look like this when it's built, but much more like the toolpath should hit these x, y, z coordinates in this order. as this you know, avant-garde, cutting-edge architect, but if you think about his work, it in fact has a lot of ties with master builders in the medieval times, and um, perhaps even further back into, and here I'm carrying a quote by Alberti about the importance of a model. And Alberti is talking about a physical model usually made out of wood, and Gary is talking about the models that they make in Katia, but still they're both trying to talk about why the model is an important thing, why you can take measurements off of it, and why it becomes more easily envisioned, more easily quantifiable, um, though obviously the media is vastly different. So what I'm going to talk about in this lecture is some of the ties that I see between some of the things going on in Gary's office and others that really harken back to a much older model, not really kind of an evolution of the kinds of working drawings that we've seen in the past, which is really more of a 19th century model. So when we go back to the traces and traits, which is um, really kind of in the um, late 15th all the way through the 17th century, these were the drawings that were done for um, stone cutters to understand how to carve the pieces of stone that would make up the different cathedral pieces and vaulting that would kind of nest together. Um, and I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, but this is a, um, the tracing room, which was, this one is in Westminster Abbey, and the um, slide on the right is actually an archaeologist uh, recreation of the plaster floor that got in Wells Cathedral. So they're two different cathedrals, but about the same time. And the tracing room was always in, um, over the course of construction of the cathedral, there would be a tracing room and the, the floor would be made out of plaster, coated with plaster. And the drawings for the stone would be done at full scale on the floor of the tracing room. And they would just keep overlaying all the drawings until they kind of couldn't see anymore what they were doing. And then they would replaster it and start over again. And so the record of what those tracings were has pretty much been lost, except for through archaeological finds like this and some of the old zinc cutouts that were made out of the thin metal that you see on the left, and some markings that you see that kind of little fish there and that spoon on the right in the stone. These were marks that the masons would just kind of make for themselves in order to keep track of what was going on. And if you can imagine some of the pieces of stone that they would be carving, it wouldn't, wouldn't be like saying, okay, this is the profile and it's just a square and you just kind of cut the profile. These would have to be projected into space because they would be trying to make um, elements that would bridge between a orthogonal condition and a rib that would be coming into it. And so they started doing these, these drawings that were fairly abstract and fairly complicated. And actually in the 17th century, these kinds of drawings, which um, the whole kind of uh, discipline had a name called stereotomy, which means the cutting of solids. And it was really a 17th century French rubric, which um, this is from Robin Evans' uh, description of projective, projective cast, um, under which was gathered several existing techniques, including stone cutting, which remained a principal concern. The basis of the stone cutting was the trait. The traits were layout drawings that were used to enable the precise cutting of component masonry blocks for complex architectural forms, especially vaults. Thereby, accurate fabrication of these parts could be achieved prior to construction. Traits are not illustrations and yield, yield little to the casual observer. These are orthographic projections, but they are not like other architectural drawings, and they were required only in exceptional circumstances. And what Evans does is he's, um, he talks a little bit about the kind of idealized um, muse of architecture sitting there with all the cherubs that run around, kind of um, taking, translating her her scribblings into these perfect pieces of stone, and how the, the drawings in relationship to the final piece have a kind of angel-like quality, so that these drawings eventually became so complex that most stonemasons couldn't really understand them, and they were really more of an intellectual exercise 
um, how, how, what system would be the most um, kind of fashionable system for um, descriptive geometry? And so these are from um, plates in, def uh, in uh, different kinds of 17th century manuscripts that I was able to find. And then this is Robin Evans's recreation on the left of uh, a drawing for the, um, this little curious piece that fit into the corner um, in the right, which was, um, which was like a staircase that connected two parts of an old, um, an old palace. And so this was destroyed, and so were the drawings. And so Evans was recreating this completely from a description and a little bit from the archaeological remnants of what was, what was happening. And I won't go into all of these geometries, but you can kind of tell the point is basically the plan point of the, the corner. And then all of those different elements begin to show you how each one of those shell-like elements of stone had to have a different geometry in order to make that fit perfectly. And so if you look at these kinds of forms, you can see, well, it's not that different than what some of the, um, it's not more difficult uh, than, or any less difficult than what Gary's asking his workers to do out of titanium. Um, and this was the, the only existing drawing that remained that, um, that Evans was able to work out for. And then, this, even though this seems like an incredibly old-fashioned way of working, um, these are drawings from a contemporary of mine who's actually teaching up at the University of Minnesota now. Um, when he was working on the recreation of a stone chapel in Oaxaca, Mexico, and had to work with some of the masons that were generations um, of, the, um, of the original masons that had done this chapel. And so in order to figure out the ways that the, um, the groin vaulting would meet each other, um, he did a series of projected geometries that began to try to understand how they would fit within the semi-sphere um, semi of, the, of the dome and how the, um, the places where the different stone pieces had to join to each other. And so he could double check what was going on in the field with the masons. And then the traces of the machine, I think, are probably really clearly shown in Bill Massey's Big Belt House, where the foam forms now are traced directly onto the concrete because the, um, the puzzle-like fit of those, which probably didn't absolutely have to look like that, becomes an expression for the concrete and becomes a very direct mark of the kind of um, complex geometries that might have gone in to making the, making the house. Or in this case, the, the tool path of the router that routed out the foam forms then becomes the ribbing of the, um, the texture for this sink. Models. Um, in the Renaissance, models were used as a very important <coughs> form of construction documentation. Paper was very uh, expensive, it was difficult to find uh, large enough sheets of parchment, etc. So models really became a primary means of communication when you wanted something built. Um, for the, um, for the, the church in Florence, the uh, Santa Maria de Fiore, um, that Brunelleschi did the dome for, the model became a kind of talisman. The workers every year would have to assemble around the model and place their hands on it, swear an oath to make the building look like the model. And um, eventually, the kind of curious thing happened, even though it was housed in this kind of very special place, eventually over the course of construction, when the main part of the, the dome was, uh, was finished, um, the models kind of moved off to the side and kind of just sat collecting dust for a long time and salvaged um, this as one of the models. And I think it may not have been the one that they were placing their hands on. Brunelleschi relied a lot on models. Um, many of the models were made out of things like wax that had disappeared, or even large winter turnips, they said, he carved and made into, um, made to look like what he wanted it to be, and then would hand those to the workers, and they would then just have to execute, figure out how to execute those things. Um, so the idea that, uh, that Gary is using of having a computer model that just governs everything is not completely new. It actually was, um, in, some, in some senses, a very old technique of, of creating a complex form and being able to communicate it most clearly. But we had a kind of shift away from this, where in the 19th century, the model for creating drawings and documents became a very legal model. And it was really um, McKimmead and White that, um, as the largest firm in its era, began to establish really clear working relationships and separating the architect from the contractor client and making really clear a sense of hierarchy and decision making between those separate entities. And then in those cases, the drawings became um, really legal documents to try to explain what the architect wanted for the contractor to do and then the architect would then um, make sure that that was being executed to the point that he wanted it to be. And so that shift in separating what the drawings should do, that they should really just represent this is what it's supposed to look like as opposed to this is what, how you make it 
or this is the steps that you need to understand that the overall geometry that, that needs to control the area that you're working was a fairly radical step and has kind of led to a distance between the representation of something and the way that it gets built. You look at this Graves project on the Wildlife Center in, um, this is in New Jersey. Um, this was the drawing and the elevation look really very much like one another. And that from the drawing, you could pretty much tell what the building would look like. There's no big surprise there. And a re relatively recent um, drawing, advertising of, Gra of Graves building, where you, know, you just take the drawing, and if you could just make the drawing big enough, and bulky enough, and last long enough, and withstand rain, you could just basically put the drawing into a cityscape, and it becomes um, equal to a building. And so the, the clause on the left is from the AIA documents, which set, kind of clearly shows how the architect has been removed from the position of being in control of the means and methods of construction. It's not for legal protection in case something should go wrong during the construction process, but it's also served to really create a distance between the person who's designing it and understanding the geometries and the person who's going to have to actually execute it. And so it's this distance that Gary has tried to insert himself The case studies that I'm going to talk most about is, is uh, Frank Gary and Associates, which is um, my kind of base of, of research these days. And I'm going to compare the two buildings, the Weissman um, done in, let's see, I think that's 90 to 93, um, and the construction administration was done by a, a, a firm that's um, affiliated with the university, Meyershire and Rockcastle. And then Experience Music Project, which was completed in um, 2001. And the two projects, the Weissman project was actually the last of the hand-drawn sets. Um, and Experience Music Project was probably the second really large-scale Katia buildings, um, the first being Bilbao, and before that, um, some smaller projects like the Barcelona Fish and some bus stops and things like that. So Experience Music Project became um, not only a, an example of a kind of full-blown use of Katia where the office felt really comfortable with what the power of, the, of that software could give them. It also represents a real shift in how manufacturers were able to embrace the Katia model and use the data to drive construction. And so, whereas Bilbao, and I didn't bring slides of Bilbao, but Bilbao, was, all the curves of Bilbao are essentially made out of straight elements that are just arrayed and displayed. Um, whereas Experience Music Project, the structural elements are curved. And in order to do that, I'll show you some slides. They needed the data from the computer model. Weissman is also essentially made out of um, straight pieces. It actually is mainly a box. And the west elevation that you see here is where most of the, the kind of um, facade activation happens. So the slide on the left, you can see the kind of orthogonal set of framing that happened in Weissman. And even though the, um, the profile up at the top of the building there is irregular, the basic grid of the framing is pretty recognizable. Whereas in Experience Music Project, it's pretty hard to say that there's a grain or a grid in there. I'll tell you a little bit more about Gary's design process. You probably know some of this from all of the press that um, he's been getting and, and the book Gary talks. Um, but the model on the left is actually not a model that gets produced very often in the office. It's kind of a, um, an attempt at a presentation model that really actually never got used. Um, they don't use Katia in the office as a way for them to check what the thing looks like. They don't use it for representation, which is very different than a lot of other offices use it for. What they do is they take physical models, and this one is made out of paper that's actually just kind of scotch taped together. Um, and then they have a digitizing arm, which is really several generations old, because Katia, um, which is a computer-aided, um, it down because I always forget. Computer aided three dimensional interactive application was developed by Dassault for, um, air, for the Mirage airplane. And so when it was to airplane standards, it's plus or minus a, you know, a 64th, I think. And most uh, architectural standards are plus or minus a 16th of the most, if you're lucky. So the whole scale of accuracy was really different. And so they were happy to give kind of old generation stuff to Gary. For Gary, it was you know, plenty accurate enough. So this is a digitizing arm that just takes points. And the operator kind of picks points off the, of the physical model. Depending on how refined they want to make that computer model, he'll pick more points. And obviously, you pick along your ridges and valleys. And you eventually can get a model that can look like this. And on the left, you see the darker lines are panel joints. And these are there's lighter lines, too. And those are different sheets that make up these larger panels. 
So you have kind of sub-panels and then bigger panels. And so that was just testing some of the ways that these things could be divided. And this was a, a, actually a fairly early scheme because they um, eventually put into the, uh, the model, they could put parameters such as no four corners should be in a XY, um, XY relationship. They could say panel sizes should not exceed um, a certain number of square inches. Um, and then the slide on the right shows the uh, places where it exceeded a certain amount of curvature or bending because they were working quite early with um, um, Zane, uh, Zaner in Kansas City. And Zaner wanted to make sure that they didn't have to actually cast any of these pieces, everything which could be rolled. And there was a limit to what you could do in terms of double curves without having to get to casting. And so they just put in the parameters that Zaner said, okay, if you're going to use sheet metal that's about this big, that's made out of, at this point, it was stainless because titanium had been priced out. Um, then this is the curvature that I can achieve for you. And if you exceed that curvature, I'm going to have to go to casting, which is going to hold us up in terms of um, time. So they basically just put that in the computer and they just said, well, we won't exceed this degree of curvature or this degree of double curvature. And then the model can tell them where they're exceeding that and they can make adjustments to that. So they use the computer model to check things and put in parameters that their structural engineers and their consultants help them develop. Um, and then, I think I have all the slides here. Then they go back to, they will use that model to generate physical, more physical models. And those physical models almost immediately get attacked by scissors and more scotch tape. And, and the physical models are the things that Gary himself works with most closely. And so the model gets, gets changed, and then it gets re-digitized into the computer model, which then outputs in some format or another um, a physical model. And this goes on and on. So the only point that the computer model is ahead of the physical model in terms of being more current in the design is at the very end. So at the very end, they produce a set of working drawings that look like this. And the slide on the left is too blurry for you to really see. But there's, um, those are all the layers that they've organized the, um, the work in. And so you can turn on and off those different layers. And some are architectural, some are engineering, some relate to structure, some relate to HVAC systems, some relate to skin, and some relate to primary structure, et cetera. They also have, um, on the right, a work point. And they've established the work point at the tops of all the beams or at the outsides of all the columns, as opposed to the center line. Because the structural engineer will often um, change things and make the beam have a slightly different dimension, but still have the same cross-sectional strength. And so in order not to have to re-dimension everything, they just pick consistent work points that they always work off of. So all dimensions are taken off of that. There's also, if you can see on the, on the upper right, um, a kind of a XY, um, XY grid that underlays the whole building. There's actually an XYZ grid for the whole thing. So there's a zero, zero, zero point that they can use that they refer to for all the dimensions on the, on the building. So these are part of the cover sheet of the set, which gives kind of an orientation of these are the rules, these are the kind of graphic rules that we're going to be following, these are the conventions that we're establishing for, for the set using the model. Now I'm comparing on the left a uh, drawing from Weissman and on the right a drawing from the Experience Music Project um, set. Sorry, the projector is never, digital is never as good as analog and this kind of stuff. So I'm sorry, it's too blurry to really read. But um, on the right you can see that what they label are just things like typical panel joint, typical face sheet, face sheet joint. And then they say, um, if there's a stainless steel gutter below that, see if you can see a model for slope and location. So in other words, this is really just eyewash. This drawing is not, does not contain any information. And they actually don't want it to contain any information because, God forbid, a, contra a contractor might try to measure off of it or use a dimension off of it. And they don't want that. They want you to go to the PTM model. And so that becomes a thing that supersedes any handwritten or two-dimensional. Contrast the drawing on the left for the Weissman building is packed full of data. There are so many points there. There's so many X, Y, Z. There's A coordinates. There's there's points that don't even exist. They're kind of you know two feet off of the center line of a column that isn't even built at the time that you need to try to figure out this canopy. And so the the designers had a really 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 difficult time trying to draw this set. And you can see the struggles in these drawings. And I'll show you a couple more. Um, they had some primitive modeling, which was um, actually developed by a guy at the University of Arizona, B. Anderson, called Upfront, that is most similar to SketchUp now. It got bought by a couple companies and morphed into a couple of different things, but in the really, really primitive version, the kind of beta testing, 
this was one of the first projects that they tried to do. So they had a really crude model that just tried to model the most difficult points. But even that was too crude to really help them understand what was going on. So they had to do a lot of dimensioning based off of points that you just had to kind of locate in space. Um, so again, Weissman on the left and Experience Music Project on the right. And if you can see the dimensions in here, um, you can see that the, the skin is actually not dimensioned at all because all of that is part of Katia and the major structure is not either. The drywall is dimensioned. The drywall starts to look like a more normal plan because all the drywall and plumbing is done kind of from the, uh, from the asphalt so that they just measure off of the existing structure and they didn't feel the need to make the um, drywall contractors pay $25,000 to have a seat on Katia to get super precise drywall dimensions. So everything within the skin becomes more normal construction that you can dimension the set has real content. Um, on the left, the, the Weissman, they had to separate the plan of the skin with the plan of any interior partitions because of the density of information. And you can see on the, um, on the left, one thing you can see is there are a lot of dimension strings, there's a lot of radii, there's a lot of points that you take radii off of. But these are, and these are plans taken at about every foot. Okay, so they had to kind of take multiple slices because the curves um, were so extreme. And then some of the sections through Experience Music Project on the right and Wiseman on the left. And the Wiseman set had, um, the reason that this one looks rather blank is that there were multiple key drawings that would relate to it that would again showing you the, um, the kind of point of the, um, the center line of that radius there, which you would just have to kind of measure off the ground and kind of put some, build something to hold that point, to hold a string, to make that line. So it was really kind of a lot of um, visual gymnastics to try to figure out how to dimension this thing in such a way that the contractors could build it. Um, and then on the left again, a Weissman connection from near the canopy and a place in the Experience Music Project where it comes out. There are some, at some points, up to a, um, I think 11, 11 feet between the skin and the structure um, because of various things, including um, including the fact that they weren't sure how much, um, how much the structure could really curve. So they weren't quite clear that the structure could take some of the very tight curves that they wanted the building form to take. So sometimes it's just skin up there in the secondary structure holding it up. And every once in a while they use it for something for it, and this gives each VAC, but a lot of it is really just pushing. And again, a, a white canopy on the, um, on the left and a, again, the work point of the Katia from the cover sheet on the right for EMP. And you can see some of the work points that they're having um, right near, there next to the insulation and in the middle of the beam, there's a work point. And I would say most contractors would not really want to try and find that work point on the site um, because as I mentioned before, a lot of those elements weren't built at the time that you had to find that work point so you were really trying to locate a point. Um, and this is all from the Weissman now. Um, just looking at some of the drawings, and, and there were many, many examples of this. And the darkened area is a piece of sheet metal that then they tried to um, dimension. You can see one element being isolated down on the bottom. So this is kind of one piece of sheet metal that they're trying to show you all the different sides and unroll it for you so that you can see how it would look like that. And these drawings really reminded me a lot of um, sheet metal drawings that you see for ductwork that it's really the same basic technique that you've got, and they had tin snips really on the job site. So a lot of the Weissman was really kind of hand measured and cut almost like a piece of fabric. So this is my experience music project again. Um, so the, the way that they got this curved structure was, you know that you, know, you can get a plasma cutter to cut the web of a wide part shape, no problem. But they could never get the flanges to really match up very well. So the flanges can be bent using a system of rollers that can be moved, um, and that movement can be driven by um, the Katia model eventually. It always sounds so great to say, well, yeah, you just take the data from the Katia model and then you drive these rollers. Well, at several software translations in between, um, you can get it to do that, but there's lots of different intermediates, and all those intermediates need to be checked back with the original. So there's a lot of translating. There's a lot of, um, kind of very tedious comparing of, of numbers point by point. Um, so it doesn't necessarily save a lot of time. It definitely would be really difficult to do without the computer. So the um, computer-controlled rollers just kind of shift around and then you get the curves on the flanges on the top and bottom. But this was the real 
mentioned that Columbia Iron and Steelworks in New Oregon, that they invented a robotic welder that could ride along the flange and make that weld right about where you see those right down there. So it would just ride along there and kind of make a continuous weld. So you could get an element that was in cross-section the same as an extruded light flange, but in form would be completely curvilinear. And so at the time that they did this, because this was um, Columbia Iron and Steelworks, they could propose this, um, <coughs> no one was really sure how tight or how much tolerance they would really be able to get. And in the end, they found that these steel beams were really uh, quite accurate. And so they could have done more of the form followed directly by the structure instead of having those very large standoffs that we saw used for the HVAC duct a minute ago. Um, and so in later projects like the Disney Concert Hall and the Case Western um, Reserve, they've done, um, they've done the same technique, but they've been more daring in saying that the structure follows the skin a little bit more closely. So what they ended up having to do was those secondary systems, they look kind of like um, precast, but they're, they're steel, they're just kind of like um, and so the, the primary steel was that white flange that I just showed you, and then there was a secondary system of steel, and then a tertiary system of steel pipe that you see on the left, and then the panels themselves, which, which had uh, what they called the rock and roll joint, you know, the GFE experience with the rock and roll joint. So there was this joint that you could kind of rock in and roll up, and so that became a waterproof, um, you know, kind of uh, labyrinth. Um, that you wouldn't get a lot of water in. Even if you did get water in, it's essentially a mainstream system so that there is a, a coating. There's um, mesh and coating. Um, it's basically shot creep and then a super expensive um, developed for the, the Navy, I think, uh, waterproofing um, because you couldn't remove these panels very easily. Since then, at Disney Concert Hall, they figured out a way to remove the panels so they could go a lot less expensive waterproofing. So the panels look like this in the shot. Um, what they ended up doing on um, EMP, regardless of the fact that it was incredibly accurate and Katia helped them every step of the way, um, the right you see that large um, black machine was a roller. So they had to bring the roller on site from Kansas City and roll the last pieces that distorted over the course of the shipping. So over the transport, some of the pieces would distort. And so they kind of built all the pieces that they could and at the end they got some pieces that just wouldn't fit. So they brought the roller on site and they had to hand roll some of those. So even in EMP, they still had to resort to some kind of lower tech techniques. Some of the visualization for this, um, you can see there's a fairly conventional surveying equipment there. Um, and then when, you, uh, when you're on site, you hear the, the people on the walkie talkie saying, um, move it over at 30 seconds. And so that's a pretty tight tolerance. That's like furniture tolerance for a building this size. And they were going off of, um, not this exact GPS reader, but a set of GPS readers where they could take the tops of, um, you, the tops of those standoffs they could measure with the GPS reader. So they had the Katia model, they knew what the steel was supposed to be, they knew that would be off a little bit. So then they could overlay that with the um, point readings on the tops of those, and that would be the skin attached to. And so that would then have another layer of accuracy so that they could update the model. So the model was, um, even though one normally thinks of construction drawings as fairly static and then they get added to with clarifications, the CATIA model actually changed so that they would change the, um, change the points when they got the as or so they got the, um, the data from what was actually in, in the site. So they would do that with those, um, with those readers. And then after the building was completely built, um, even though the CATIA model had been updated and they had a lot of information, they didn't have a lot of information on some of the last things to be put in, like the pipes and the sprinkler system. So when they were doing an addition, they had to, they could either go to the CATIA model and try to update it, but they found it was a lot simpler to use um, the CIREC system, which um, sends out uh, points and point clouds and, we, and we can bounce them back. And then they can color code it afterwards to figure out what uh, what is structure, what's insulation, and what's um, pipe. Yeah, I can take questions. 
great kind of uh, techno music that I don't have for you here. But the car drives through this field and it generates these curves, and that curve then becomes the building. And you could do all these kind of analyses that show the different um, elements and stresses on the frame. And then the, the shape of the building basically it go, it takes the standard truss and um, makes one side wavy. Either the outside cord becomes really wavy or the inside cord becomes really wavy and so they kind of morph from one to the other. Um, and so you can see here some of the different frames. With the, on the top left, the outer cord is fairly orthogonal um, and the inner cord is very wavy. And then by the time you get to the middle, the outer cord is very wavy and the inner cord is relatively orthogonal. Okay, so, um, and this is just a fairly basic plasma cutting, um, and they can just weld up these, these trusses in a, um, on a factory floor in segments, bring them, chuck them to site, lower them into place, and then um, I, um, have these little nodes on the side. And the skin in this case is fabric because it was a temporary structure. Um, and that was one of the only places where they actually had to get a hand done connection where someone had to go up and climb, climb on the thing. Um, but essentially, the, the premise of his office is that everything can be done digitally. And he purposely, I think, uses consultants from all over Europe. And so no one is actually ever in one place at one time. Um, and the program that they use to exchange things is mostly Rhino, which is a much cheaper um, kind of analogous program to CATIA um, that Gary has also been experimenting with. But I think in the end, they decided um, it was better for them to just adapt CATIA to just adapt to TM instead of um, switching to a new program that they had invested in. Um, so another firm is Sharpless Mold and Pasparelli. And they won a competition for the Greenpoint channel, um, which would be a, a whole set of park-like um, buildings that would, one would be a carousel that you see that round one, which was built. And then the most recent one, which is a little uh, camera obscura, that it looks like a little teardrop shape. I'm not sure it's on these plans. This might have been earlier. And they also had an idea of a kind of a force field that swept through the swept through the site and, and had these different diagrams explaining how the, the pieces connected. I won't go into all of that, but talk more about the actual camera obscura, um, which takes images from the sky and projects them onto the ground here. And so there's different layers that had to screen the light so that the entrance is over there on the left and um, this yellow screen kind of protected the light space. Um, of, the, of the door in, uh, from the dark space of where the camera would project that little oval that you see through there. So it's basically kind of an egg crate structure where you have vertical elements that would be notched to receive horizontal elements. But no two pieces were the same. Um, so this was the drawing set. And the drawing set is definitely different than a normal drawing set. Even though it was a very small building, um, all of the elements were kind of thought of as like an inventory. So it was essentially like a kit of parts, um, but the kit was with more repeating elements. And so some of these drawings were kind of more presentation oriented. The drawing I just showed you, the one that was more inventory oriented, that was what became the construction documentation. Um, they did have some of these just to kind of illustrate what was going on. And you know, it's very much like the kind of diagrams you get when you get a computer or a piece of electronics of how all these things need to fit together. So the, again, this is from the, the working drawing set. And you can see they basically cataloged, you know, of the type, um, you know, A01, there's two of those, and A02, there's two of those, and then you start to get into these other ones where you get, you know, a few more repeating shapes, or you get some unique shapes in through there, and then those are how they all fit together. And one of the things that Chris Sharpless has said in an interview uh, for Wired Magazine is that the 3D drawings are used as a basis for a set of instructional drawings that catalog the 650 plus metal and 100 plus wood components and outline the procedures by which they are to be assembled. The need for shop drawings is eliminated. Intelligence is built into all the pieces, ensuring that if one screws part A to part B, the entire building will come together seamlessly. So my question here is kind of, you know, if you build intelligence into all the pieces, then that kind of assumes that there's no intelligence needed to assemble. And so the worker, in fact, in this scenario, doesn't need to know what the building's going to look like in the end. They're just kind of working along, you know, slotting A into B, but they don't really have a sense of what the overall building is going to be or how, how it needs to work or, or any kind of performative criteria. It's simply a kind of a set of assembly instructions. 
And again, these are plans um, taken at different points so you can kind of see where the curvature and then um, sections, the kind of exploded set of uh, sections up on the top showing the metal connectors. Tripyramid is a small firm. They actually are um, not architects. They're really uh, fabricators, engineering and fabricators. And they do all the stainless steel parts for um, like the Jamie Carpenter mm -hmm. glass walls and things like that. And so the project I'm going to show you is not that big tower by KPF, but this tiny little entry piece on the that spiraling down um, on the foot of the tower um, by. Uh, oh no, I just blanked on the name. Um, it's from in New York. I did the Dia Foundation. Anyway, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, so the architect was um, doing this. It didn't have to be completely enclosed, and it was this spiraling. Um, an elevator in the core and a spiraling stair that would just bring you up to the lobby level um, and then up to the penthouse of the art center. So this was the Mori, Mori Art Center. And so the, it was kind of a, a cable net structure and all of the, um, when they tried to unroll some of these things, they realized because it was, it was regular in plan, it was kind of egg-shaped. And then in section it was also kind of regular that it tapered. But it meant that the angle of the cables coming into any joint was almost always different. So every angle coming in had to be slightly changed for the angle going out, and they were all different from each other. So they would have to do, they did a lot of these kinds of drawings. And I'll show you. Let's see if it runs. Okay, so this is, um, I've imported it into a um, a little video for you, but if it were to come to you as the architect, you'd be able to manipulate it. So you'd have a handle, you could kind of turn it around, you could stop it any place that you wanted. And these drawings have no dimensions. The dimensions they have are only for quality checking, just to kind of make sure they're, you know, talking about a piece that's you know, two feet long, not twenty feet long. Um, but they don't, they don't um, use them for anything more than just kind of a check. The nice thing about this is done in SolidWorks, and SolidWorks um, has a read-only built-in. So no one has to agree, okay, we're all going to use Rhino or we're all going to use Katia. In Katia, the startup costs in Katia are enormous because not only is every seat, once you buy the program, every additional seat is $25,000, you have to have a trained operator to use that. Um, so, you know, in Santa Monica, there's a whole cottage industry of ex-Gary people that are swinging <coughs> up to support these poor subcontractors that can't afford this but want to get access to the Katia model to build their cabinetry or whatever. So, um, you know, the software, even though it's cheaper software, it becomes difficult for everyone to agree, okay, we're all going to use this consistent thing, or we're all going to be able to export, and there's a limit to how many, how universal these things are when you export them. So one thing that, um, that SolidWorks has done is just said, okay, we're going to bundle in this read-only, so anyone can open this and view it, print off of it, sketch over it, and send the facts back. And so for the purposes of Tri-Pyramid, this is really ideal. Um, they don't use any 3D scanning, they just take the data that the, that's provided by the, the architect and then they create these. And so that's the piece and you can see how you can adjust the, um, the angles because of the, the kind of bell shape at the, at the end. The cable can slightly change an angle as it comes up and then they get kind of clamped together um, to make the, the joint. So that's what the, the joint looks like in place. So now we're in the position of asking, what are we drawing? There's the physical thing that we're drawing, but we're also sometimes trying to get at things like the performance of a building, or how the building is coming together. So we're dealing now with assembly. We're potentially dealing with stuff that's happening over time. We're potentially dealing with stuff that's so ephemeral it never gets measured. So how do we represent this stuff? There's an interesting kind of chicken and egg question that Bill Mitchell posed. Does technology drive new form? Like, I have aerogel on the right, but what do I do with it? Or does new form drive the technological means to achieve it? I'm Frank Gehry, and I need to figure out how to get this thing built. And there's related representation questions with this. I have aerogel. How do I represent it in such a way that the performative properties are evident to me as I'm designing so that I don't ignore that? The only application so far for aerogel, which is basically weightless, it's as close to weightless as you can get. Um, and it has incredible insulation properties. They used it for gaskets on the space shuttle. That's the only use so far. 
But there's a lot of excitement about maybe using it to fill windows so that you can, instead of filling it with gas, you can fill it with aerogel and you get almost perfect insulation. It's not transparent, but it would be a translucent type of filling. And so there's been a lot of, kind of speculation on, you know, in their, I think it was 3M invented this material. So now it's kind of, okay, well, so what do we do with it other than, you know, gaskets and the space shuttle? And so if you were trying to figure out what to do with it, you have to get some of it and play with it. But you also have to be able to draw it in a way that those properties are evident to you as you're designing so you don't just forget about it and you're not just kind of intellectually thinking, okay, what is this stuff? There's no history behind some of these materials. So how do you draw it in a way that lets you understand it and lets the drawing bring out some of these things? Um, or I am Frank Gehry and I need to explain to lots and lots of people how to make it look like this way. So in some ways we've come from um, a period where you've got complexity going from really simple kind of primitive buildings in earlier parts of time to these pretty complex buildings that we see now, the kind of blobs or beyond. And we've seen this kind of dip. So as labor costs have kind of slowly risen, and there's probably spikes in there, but I've just sort of simplified it to labor has gotten more and more and more expensive. And so there's a point where in the kind of Gothic cathedral area or in the French trompe that I showed you that little connector piece, People were willing to have incredibly high uh, complexity, and labor costs were really cheap. And so they developed ways of working with this labor to communicate to them. And then at a certain point, like probably in the 50s, when labor costs were pretty high, people just said, let's just make the dumbest buildings we can. They're just like lift slab, or tilt up, they're just like stuff you pour on the ground, and you put it up, and then you enclose it, and you're done. Um, and so that was a, a kind of a low point in saying that there was the possibility of complexity. And that was perfect for the kinds of drawings that were the legal documents that uh, the 19th century model. But as we've gotten into more and more complex buildings with higher and higher layer costs, you can't just say, well, we'll just get you know, thousands of people to work on this for four generations and we can get it built. We have to really be super efficient in how we're communicating what needs to get built. So as these two things have started crossing, we've had to be more inventive in how we communicate. So one of the areas that I think we've been focusing on recently has been more formal and compositional. And what I'd like to see is if there's going to be more exploration into things that might be performative. How can we use representation to show things that are hard to see, hard to experience? So this was um, this, this is the interior atrium space of the GLA building, the thing that kind of looks like a, a little pod on the banks of the Thames that Foster did. And Arabs Acoustics. Um, help the model what that would be for a speaker. If you even know the kind of basics of acoustics, you can tell you would just be bombarded with echoes, and as the speaker, you would probably not be able to hear yourself think. And so they found that that shape, even though it seemed like it would be ideal to kind of have everybody looking down in a centralized space, really clean, kind of focused onto the speaker, was really horrible for acoustics. So by changing the geometry of the neck of the flask, um, they were able to create a much better acoustical um, situation for the speaker in this, um, this is the, the uh, British Parliament, basically, or the, no, it's the city, sorry, city, city hall. Um, so you have a lot of cases for those audience and speakers. Um, so this is, I think, a good example of how you can use, um, how you can use the kinds of technologies we have to explore things that aren't simply driven completely by, I want it to look like this. Now, in the past, the power of drawings to explain ephemeral things related to experience or time were really important. In Fontana's um, moving of the Vatican obelisk, the, draw the competition drawing showed how he was actually going to communicate to all these thousands of people's working. The thousands of people working. So it was actually a competition not for what the obelisk should look like or even where it would go, but how would you get it from where it was to its new location? And so Fontana, you know, lots of different architects tried different ways of how they would do the scaffolding, how they would transport it. But one of the things that Fontana decided is that he would use trumpet signals so that a trumpeter could tell everybody and all the horses and the men when to go and when to stop. And that was something that was really critical to the design, which was about the experience of how you would move this thing and the sequence of how that would be done. I'm almost at the end here. I'm just going to go really quickly through some drawings that also began to deal with construction sequence. These were done for the Tokyo Forum building. 
The Japanese contractor kind of storyboarded how things would work. This was a top-down construction. So they had to figure out how construction would be happening down below while it was also going up. So they had to storyboard how the machines would get in and out, which pieces of the closet would be left open so that they could still haul dirt um, up and how haul steel down. And this is a drawing um, from Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest. And the T is Thornail, and the little cross shape is the airplane. And the numbers show places in the script. So these were the sequence that they were shot, but not necessarily the sequence that we view it in the final film. Um, so you really are dealing with a kind of timing and sequence and planning so that there's the kind of final finished film that he's thinking about, but then there's also the logistics of how do you get the crop duster, how do you get the camera angles to work. Pardon? That's in Vienna. 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 Like, uh, I should uh, get you a picture so I can have these side by side. Um, and Scarpa. Scarpa's drawings show a deep understanding of kind of a simultaneous spatial quality, material quality. There's a dimensional aspect, but then there's also a, a kind of, it's all surrounding you. And everything is at different scales. There's multiple things overlaid. There's, it's rendering in some areas and then working drawings in others. And Scarpa said, I want to see things. I don't trust anything else. I place things in front of me on paper so that I can see them. I want to see, therefore I draw. I can only see an image if I draw it. So I don't really have a definitive conclusion to propose for the future of drawing. For myself, I'm looking to firms where there's, um, and other kind of early adopters to see where construction documents are going in the profession. And these practitioners are innovative not because they need to, and not from some kind of abstract academic set of goals, but as an academic, I feel like I can serve their I can serve to kind of place their work in a context that they're not really even thinking about. They're kind of innovating and, and pushing these things because they just need to get their stuff built. And in some ways, as an academic, I have the, uh, the distance and perspective to kind of figure out what, what they're really doing and what it might mean to other people. And so looking across what's going on, I think there's two major unexplored areas. One is the performative, um, the ways of representing the behavior of the system, material, or even the machine to have. And then also, there's another area which I haven't really shown any examples of because I haven't found any yet. Um, but it's the idea that drawing could be like a musical score, that you could basically give instructions and materials and sort of see what happens. And that not even the architect would know what would end up look, it would end up looking like, but it would just be done through a series of instructions <laughs> with the material that was given in a certain way. Um, so there's the possibility that there could be this highly interpretive way of, of drawing and the kinds of, um, of things that are happening. So a great question for this generation of architects and students is, if Moneo says drawing is knowledge, and there's no better test of our knowledge than our ability to draw it, have we then reached the end of our knowledge and of our ability to envision? Perhaps this is true, but I hope not. But in the endless pursuit of more knowledge, more data, and better ways of communicating them, we need to also keep in mind the words of T.S. Eliot. All knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance. All ignorance brings us nearer to our death but nearness to death is no nearer to God. Where in life have we lost, where is the life that we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom that we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge that we have lost in information? The cycles of heavens in 20 centuries bring us farther from God and nearer to dust. So I don't want to end on a down note here, but I think that it's, it may be crazy to say that drawing could be a solution to this problem kind of overwhelming amounts of information where we're just kind of forgetting everything, forgetting our knowledge, forgetting any kind of wisdom. But I have such faith in drawing and models also as ways of representation, ways of designing, ways for us to represent for ourselves and for others. But I really actually believe that better drawings and models that we need to invent can actually lead the way in the pursuit of wisdom, not just knowledge or information. Before we get to the uh, the, uh, the food out here, and um, so I'm just going to open it up for anyone that has questions right now. I guess maybe I'll start off. Um, one of the one of the things I think that's interesting. I was thinking about what you were saying with this this dumb slotting when I was putting together my IKEA chair this weekend, 
and uh, and there are no there are no words or text to go with the, the diagrams that you use to assemble these things. 